Hello, fellow quilters, and welcome. I'm Susan Smith. I'm in my studio, Stitched by Susan. And today, we're going to quilt and sip coffee. So, yeah, this weekend, I'll just chat a little bit while a few more people have a chance to join. Um, this weekend, my husband and I went on a little road trip into northern Idaho. We live not too far from the state line. And um, so we were away for a couple of days and just, just relaxing and what have you. And so first off, we saw signs of spring, which is so encouraging to me. You know, the willow trees that are this kind of little green blur. And I love that. But also we had, what did we have, Dave? Snow, sleet, rain, a little bit of sunshine. <laughs> so we got to see sort of all four seasons in one weekend. It was fantastic. Anyway, it was a nice couple days away. So today we are going to be quilting an entire project from start to finish. If you're new to these live and unscripted episodes, let us know in the comments. I know some of you have been chiming in where you're from. And actually, maybe let's take a minute and welcome people from all over the U.S. And I have to take my glasses off to read the screen, to read my monitor. Where's everyone from? So Dave, my husband, is the producer. He's behind the scenes, behind all the cameras and monitors and cables and what have you. And so he's popping up all the comments now. Sienna from BC, Canada. That's my home province. Um, what else? Is anyone else here, Dave? Only Sienna? Well, no, I'll let you know her machine. Oh, I see. I have a 2012 Anova 26 with all the bells and whistles. Nice. I, I, I really like Anovas, too. So the question I gather was, where are you from and what kind of machine you are running? Because I'm kind of curious to know who's, who's watching in these videos. Yvonne, I've seen you lots before. Hi, Susan. It's another dreary day in White Bear Lake, Minnesota, and the geese are going crazy. What a racket. Oh, my. Well, it's a sunny day here, which I'm happy about. Sunny morning. Good morning, Susan and Dave from Darlene, from Helena, Montana, joining in today. Welcome. Mickey from North Georgia Mountains. I quilt on a 2016 APQS Millie. I'm familiar with that one. Good. Darlene has a Gamel Classic and love it. I had a Gamel Classic too. My Lucy 1.0 was a classic. Now I have a Vision and it's a fairly recent upgrade for me. Eileen, good morning, Susan and Dave from Ogden, Utah and watching, listening while working on a quilt. Fantastic. That's my favorite that we can just kind of get together and have a little quilting bee long distance. And Martin, good morning from Hasbrook Heights, New Jersey. Good. Donna from Southern Oregon. I have a 1999 Gamel Classic with the Intella Quilter added on. Excellent. Rosemary, good morning from Kamloops, BC. Again, my home province. I know exactly where you are. And Janine from Lakeland, Florida. New watcher Lisa from Wisconsin. Fantastic. Jenna from Suncrest, Washington. And Rhonda Williams from Central Kentucky. I always enjoy your chats. Excellent. Melody, good morning from Kent, Washington. That's not too far from me, too. Erin from Post Falls, Idaho. Well, Erin, I'm going to spill the beans here. It's actually Erin's quilt that I'm working on today, so I'm glad she's chimed in to see it, see it happening. Connie, I'm here in sunny Spokane, Washington on a Tin Lizzie. And Sienna, love your mug. Isn't that sweet? My sister gave me that. It's kind of bumblebees, abstract, and it's you can't see, but it's a bright blue inside, kind of an indigo blue. I love it. Charlene from Minnesota, welcome. Linda from Norwich, UK, fantastic. Francoise from the end of the day in Belgium. I love that you keep joining us, Francoise. Thank you for doing that. Lisa from Wisconsin, yep. Central Iowa, Christine. So we have people from all over the US for sure and a few from around the world, the other side of the globe. Hello from Minnesota, Michelle. Arlene from next door in the valley, yes. Louise from Williams Lake, BC, also know where that one is. Debbie from Plymouth, Michigan. Barbara from Chattanooga, Tennessee. Bernina Q20 on a frame. Nice. And Jana, 2017 APQS Larry. Okay, I'm not familiar with I'm not familiar with Larry. Is that a typo or do I just not know that machine? That's entirely possible. Debbie, a 2004 APQS Millennium. Nice. Christine, contemplating purchasing a long arm. Oh, welcome to the club. <laughs> Linda, I have a Voyager 17, no bells and whistles, but a little workhorse. Mm -hmm. Sometimes those are the best kind. Becky watching from Utah. Joan, hi, Susan. Oh, Joan, we're, we go way back, Joan and I do. We were neighbors 15 or 20 years ago. 
Neighbors okay. are relatives. You're yeah. 30 miles away. Yeah, I, ha I have to explain neighbors. So we lived in very northern British Columbia, and uh, Joan was probably 30 miles away from me, but still neighbors. <laughs> we met at all the community events. Sally Walter from Vancouver, Washington. I quilt on an Anova with Navigator 2. Nice. Janet Larry was an early model. He's been discontinued. That would explain why I'm not familiar with the name. Not that I know every machine by any means, but... Okay, we're going to get to quilting. Wow, that was a, that's a lot of people. Thank you so much for all joining in. So let me introduce just a little bit the big picture of what these episodes are. They're just me quilting, basically streaming my quilting real time, live and unscripted, hence the title, in my studio. So you get to see me do a project right from loading it to unloading and all that comes in between. And often they are either my own quilts or client quilts. So you'll get to see me deal with whatever challenges. And I don't necessarily mean problems, but it could be thread choices or deciding whether to baste or whether to do double batting or just all the decisions and choices that I make along the way. So this is not a lesson. This is just me kind of talking through the particular project that I'm working on. So if, you know, if you're newer to long arming, I think you will find this really beneficial in that I can remember that feeling of there just being so many questions when I go to load a quilt. Does it matter if I load it this way or this way? You know, does it matter how much backing I have extra? How big should my batting be? How do I choose thread? I mean, there's just so many questions when you're a new quilter and it's not easy to work alongside someone, right? Because you can't swap long arms to your friend's house. So this is just a chance for you to come into my studio, watch over my shoulder and see how I do things. I don't claim to do them the only right way, it's just my way. So you get to see how I do it. So I'm quilting on a Gamel Vision 26 inch throat. You can see the Gamel symbol, I think in the camera. Um, you are welcome to share this episode with any of your friends. You should be able to do that if you wish while we're watching. We'll be something like two hours streaming today. So people are welcome to chime in and out. Or as some of you have, you've just got it kind of going in the background while you're working on your projects, which is so fun. So share if you can. Let me ask a favor too, because we're watching this on my Facebook page. I would love if some of you would add a I think it's a recommendation on a business page. You can't even do a review, but it gives me a star rating, which currently is zip because I have no recommendations on there. So I'd be really appreciative if some of you who are joining these would write just a few words in that recommendation. And that just kind of helps my page to grow. And I'd appreciate that. Do we have a question? Yeah. Sandy, I quilt on an HQ Fusion. Love free motion. Me too. You're in good company. And Pat Halling in La Center, Washington. I quilt on an Anova, not computerized. I love free motion and ruler work. Ditto. I do too. Okay. On to our quilt. I'm going to move Lucy. My long arm is named Lucy. I'm going to move her out of the way. And we're just going to be super careful of cables here today. Because we've got a bit of a... Remember how we used to play Cat's Cradle when we were cribs, right? When we were kids. And have all those funny strings between your fingers. It's a little bit like that in my studio with cables. So let's get started. I've got the backing here. Is that about my limit, Dave, right there? Okay. So I start by loading my backing at the front of the machine. And today I've made a couple of decisions in advance. When I can, when there's a seam in my backing, I prefer for my seam to run from side to side. This is because if it runs from top to bottom vertically, it doesn't spool onto my rollers quite as smoothly and I have to pay a little more attention to getting it smooth and straight and not having that seam pull a little tighter. So the horizontal is always preferable. But another thing that I often consider is if it matters which way I'm quilting my quilt, like must I start at one end and work to the other end or can I turn it sideways? And sideways is often more efficient because quilts are longer and, and less wide. Does that make sense? So if the length is this way, then I can do fewer passes in the quilt. So sometimes that will be a choice, but today's particular design is directional. It is fans and they're quilted in rows. And so I'm actually going to start at one end of the quilt and quilt to the other end. So all that said, my seam is going to run horizontally from side to side. 
across the backing. I do use the red snapper system, which you're seeing here, but this can be done equally well with pins. With my method of loading, you do not need to center this way, this way, there, so you can see a little better. Okay. With this method of loading, you do not need to worry about where the centers of your leaders are or the center of your backing. Just load it where it is convenient to you on this first edge. You do want a straight edge, and I do have a selvage here, so I know that it's straight. So whether you're pinning or whether you're red snappering, doesn't matter. Just attach it at this front side. I have to try and go a little bit more to the right. Still okay? We're just at the limit of the length of our cords today. So I'm coming around the machine now. You'll see me in a second, big in front of the camera. And basically I'm pulling this entire backing so it's hanging smooth over the take up roller of my machine and over the back side of it. And I take care, even if I have a really large backing that has some excess falling on the floor, I take care that that is really well smoothed out because what I'm going to do is just roll this straight onto my machine. And as long as I have this laid on nice and smooth, it will roll straight. This is how I can get away without doing all the centering process. And then a second little tip, where's my camera there? I've got a water bottle, oh, there we are. Got a water bottle in my hand. And I'm just going to gently spritz this whole backing and all those folding creases will just relax right out of it without me needing to take an iron to it. Super simple. Okay, and now we'll start rolling it up. So that front straight edge is going to pull it on. I might mention one other thing. I've purposely left, can I see where my cameras are, Dave? I've purposely left, of course you can't see it under there now, but this leader, so the canvas, leader that's attached to my roller, I've purposely left some of it hanging down because when I'm pulling this fabric, I want a little bit of friction and resistance here. That's what keeps this straight. Does that make sense? So you'll see as I roll this up closer to the end, you'll be able to see it again. So I've got that underneath leader. I'm holding it so that it can't roll with the fabric. Instead, it's holding stationary and providing just a wee bit of resistance. So I'm just going to roll until I see the bottom of my fabric with about, oh, an inch and a half or so to spare. Now, if you were pinning, you would have to approach this a little bit differently in that um, you would have to leave enough excess fabric to probably lay that leader right down on the flat part of your machine at the back. So that's an adjustment you may have to make if you're pinning, but this roll it on method will work for pins. I did it for many, many, many quilts. But for my red snappers, I'm just gonna roll up until I can feel my little ridge under here. And if this end were not straight, I would just let the excess, you know, if there's more at one side than the other, I would just let that be because I've rolled it on straight. So I'm pretty confident that this is parallel to my roller. So I'm just gonna clip it right where it is and not let it shift. And I'm sorry if that's shaking the camera. It takes quite a bit of force actually to snap these little red snappers on. And there they are. So now I can just finish rolling. I'm just going to give one more spritz to that middle crease. The middle fold, you know, of a piece of fabric is often quite distinct. Tiny bit more water on that and we're good to go. And just like that, I have a back loaded. 
nice and smooth, ready to load my batting. Okay, today I am using black batting and you'll see when I come to the quilt that it is quite, mostly quite dark fabrics and the backing obviously is fairly dark too. It's this deep olive green. So let's talk a little bit about batting. My preference whenever I have a deeply colored quilt is to go with black batting. That prevents white fibers from poking through onto a dark backing and it keeps the colors almost richer looking. Really anything that's, you know, deep tan and darker or mid blue and darker. Um, you can often get away with a black batting and if in doubt, put a piece of batting behind your quilt top and see, because of course you don't want black to show through, but equally you don't want white to be kind of shimmering through. But in this case, it's definitely a black. And here comes our gorgeous quilt. So Erin has made this quilt and she can chime in here if I'm telling the story incorrectly, but it's from fabrics that are from Japan and they are absolutely gorgeous. They're very textured, very rich. I don't think that you'll be able to capture any of that on camera, but it, they're really, really pretty. And one other consideration is this. Erin has marked for me the top of the quilt which is super handy, by the way, if you're not a long armor, it's super handy to do for your long armor or to tell your clients. Really handy to just have the top mark that simply. But in this case, I'm quilting a fan design and I will quilt it with the curved edge of the fan toward me. So I actually want to do the quilt upside down so that when I'm finished, the curved edges are on the tops of the fans. Does that make sense? So I'm actually going to load this quilt with the bottom at this end. So I'm quilting from the bottom to the top. And we're going to mute the mic for just a second while we try and affix, affix it to my cheek. It keeps falling off. So give us just a second here. Okay, hopefully that will work better. That's the joys of doing stuff live like this. Whenever a little thing happens, you just have to take a sec and correct it. Okay, I think I've got everything smooth and flat on there. Maybe let's talk for just a minute about thread. Um, my thread choices for this, I've vacillated a little bit, but here's my philosophy on thread. In general, I don't want my thread to be the first thing you see when you look at the quilt. I prefer it to take a bit of a back seat. So when I'm looking at a quilt like this that has quite dark areas and then some areas that are a good deal lighter, my tendency is to go for a thread that's in the middle of the road. So it won't look really, really light against the dark fabrics and it won't look really, really dark against the lighter fabrics. Does that make sense too? So for example, if I picked the navy from this background, my thread would almost disappear in this border, but it would show up a lot in these lighter areas. If I picked alternatively this tan color, it would almost disappear in these light khaki areas and it would be high contrast on these borders. So what I've done instead is go middle of the road and I've picked a fairly dark khaki. So it's much more similar to this little border, which is the same fabric as the backing. It's a shade or two lighter than the backing. So it shows up somewhat in the navy border and somewhat on these tan and khaki bits. And I feel like that's a good um, all purpose answer. Questions, Erin, yes, the fabrics are from Japan. The quilt pattern is designed by my friend, Anna Kaluin art at Artist Within. So there you go, some details on the quilt for you if you wanna look that up. Okay, I'm safe to roll, Dave, yes. <laughs> the first time I roll from side to side is always a nail biter just to make sure we're not clipping any cords.
bear with us a sec. We're going to shift the cameras a little bit. I apparently didn't line up the quilt exactly where we had planned it, and so it's not all showing. So Dave will put a question up, and I'll chat a minute while he shifts the cameras around. Lisa, did you and Aaron discuss the quilt design? Yes, we did, Lisa. So I tend to, um, when my clients book a quilt, I ask them if they prefer emails, phone calls, texts, and most tend to go toward texts, which suits me beautifully because then I can send pictures back and forth. Do you like this? Do you like this? And then we agree on a quilting design. So what I'm doing now is just basting the outer perimeter of this quilt. I've got it laid on smoothly and I believe straight on my batting. I might add, if, if A, you aren't very comfortable with knowing whether it's straight or not, or B, if you've got a quilt that has you know, less than square borders and things to it, then you might want to take the time to pin that first. I'm pretty comfortable with it, and Aaron's quilt is beautifully straight and flat, so I'm just embarking on the basting. Also, my Lucy does have channel locks, which are a magnetic lock on the rails. So now, for example, I've got the horizontal lock on, and so I know I'm getting a straight horizontal line. And my left hand is just making minute adjustments all the way across to make sure that I'm within that quarter inch um, seam allowance at the edge and to adjust if I need to pull it up or down just a little bit. I pretty much always find, and this may be just my machine, that my hopper foot wants to push the fabric out just a little bit in front of me. So I have my left hand resting gently on the bit that's already been stitched. And I'm always putting just a little bit of tension on that so that the fabric at the front keeps feeding, feeding smoothly under the hopper foot. When I get to the corner and I change my horizontal lock to be a vertical one, and now then I absolutely know that I'm going to have a straight vertical line on this. Whoops, put the wrong one on. There we go. So I know my corner is 90 degrees. I know this line is straight. I'll adjust my quilt if necessary. So in some other episodes, I've talked at more length about what to do if you have excess fabric or unevenness or some areas of the quilt that are narrower than other areas. I won't go into that a ton today because we're working on a nice straight quilt. And as I said early on, I try to have each day's sort of chatting be about what this quilt is. Other days have other topics. Okay, it is straight, it is flat. The last thing I do is add my big old magnets. So my quilting machine has iron rails. So these magnets are what hold my quilt top firmly in place. So I have left the, the top floating. It's just hanging down right in front of my work area, the batting and the top as well. But putting these magnets on keeps it from pulling up as I'm quilting this area. It will keep everything perfectly straight and square and this can't shift. So these are inexpensive from the hardware store. As long as you have magnetic bars, they're a great tool. Sure, let's have a question. I'll get a, I'll get a sip of my cup while we look. Monica, does the black batting darken the white lighter fabrics in the quilt? In this case, Monica, it does not. For one thing, these are quite heavy and robust fabrics, so the black doesn't show through at all. Um, I mean, that's chiefly why, honestly. And they're not as pale as they might appear on camera. This one is a fairly deep tan. This one is khaki. And then, of course, the golds and reds and olives. Um, but that is something you would want to test before you use black fabric or black batting, I'm sorry. So actually put some black batting behind your quilt or put some white or some natural behind and you can decide for each quilt if that looks satisfactory. Arlene, in a, question, in a previous video, your channel locks were not engaging. What did you do to get them working again? I rebooted my um, tablet. Arlene, I turned off my machine and rebooted the thing and started again and away it went. I mean, they are magnetic. They're not really electronic. Only the button is electronic, right? And so it was just a matter of restoring that connection and it was smooth. Mm -hmm. 
So something that we're probably going to find today is that because I have such a high contrast between dark fabrics and light fabrics, the light balance on my recording camera does not handle that very well. So I'm going to just apologize in advance. You're going to see it getting always trying to adjust for that light difference. That's the limitation of my camera equipment. And while I'm on that topic, by the way, I told you guys last week I had introduced this little feature called buymeacoffee.com, which enables you, the watcher, if you wish, to make a one-time donation toward my little show. And our goal is we do want to get some better camera equipment. At this point, um, we're recording with, like, literally on a shoestring with our smartphones. And um, so there are other cameras that would do better with that lighting or would show the quilting more clearly from a distance, some depth reading and stuff like that. So that's kind of our next goal in mind. But I do want to say an enormous thank you to those of you who have already logged in to buymeacoffee.com and contributed. We appreciate it. I think Dave will, yep, there he, he's got a link up there because you need that slash stitched by Susan on it. Okay, today we are going to use my favorite marking tool, painter's tape. And for my fans, this is something that's completely up to you as you're quilting. But for me, I like my fans to be about three and a half inches in size. So I've just got a straight ruler. And I'm just going to lay my tape on top of the quilt to mark my stitching row. And I make my tape extend far enough out the end that it sticks on the batting because that's what holds it from rolling up as tape wants to do. And I do not carefully measure all the way across the quilt. I've gauged my distance from the seam allowance here, and I'm just going to lay my tape down and maybe check it once at the other end with my ruler. This is not an exact science. This is a guideline. We're freehand quilting. Remember, we're not a computer and never have been. Get my tape long enough to reach the batting on the other end. Get the wrinkles out of it. Take our ruler and see if we're close. Called? All righty, so we've got that marked. The next thing I do is just for this first row of quilting, can you see my other favorite marking tool? Piece of chalk, just inexpensive white school chalk. I want my fans also to be about three and a half inches wide. So for the first row only, I kind of establish that spacing. So I've just got a yardstick and actually, Dave, would you mind handing me that other yardstick? This was my grandfather's and the problem with it is I can't read the numbers on it. So I have to have my other one which was also my granddad's, but is in better shape. And I'll show you what else I use these for in a moment. So I'm just going to run along the top. And because I have black batting, I'm able to just put a little dot on that batting. Well, Dave, I don't think it's critical for them to see this. It's not that uh, technical. You know, and again, it's a guideline. You do not have to carefully, carefully measure these. Just whack a dot on there every three and a half inches or thereabouts. And this will just establish our spacing. And then after this first row, I will only mark um, the depth of the row. And then we'll just eyeball these fans one below another. And I should mention too, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about the quilting design today because I do have classes where I present these designs in much more detail and depth. So I encourage you to check out those classes. I have a freehand quilting masterclass and a freehand primer if you want to know the details about the quilting. These episodes are more about the big picture of the whole project of doing a quilt and some of my favorite tools. So I've already got my machine threaded and some bobbins loaded. Um, I've done a fresh oiling on my machine and removed all the lint, so we are ready to go today.
I hope that you can see the thread well enough to kind of get a sense of what I meant by saying I pick a middle of the road thread. It is certainly lighter than the colors that are in this border. But as we progress into the next rows, you'll see that it's darker than the tans and khakis that are in the center. And so it just, it blends fairly well with both and it shows up about equally on all the colors. I get asked quite often if I use variegated threads for projects like this. I do not. Personally, I don't care for variegated threads. They do answer the problem of, you know, including all the multiple shades and colors, perhaps, that are in a quilt top. But in my opinion, I don't like that you have no control over where the darks and the lights end up. And so you end up, to me, the thread ends up looking almost chopped. You know, it will totally disappear in some places and then be high contrast in other places. And I don't care for that look. But that's personal preference. We're pausing for just a second. We're gonna just give this a little try. Um, see if this will help control that light shifting that you guys are getting so you can see this first row of fans. If I lay something dark over my leader, that may prevent the camera from flashing in and out. There we go. It's funny how the little things sometimes can make all the difference. And I'll be 100% honest, these are the sorts of things that have kept me from doing YouTube episodes and especially these live episodes in the past is there are so many things on this ginormous machine and because you're working in a whole room, you know, and you're moving, um, there's just so many things you can't control. But eventually, I decided to just go for it. Actually, who am I kidding? Dave kind of just browbeat me into going for it. <laughs> And of course we're learning. It's like that with so many things in life. You just have to start somewhere and then gradually you learn. You may notice that I have my machine set much higher than most quilters do or a lot of quilters. I prefer to quilt with it at a higher level usually. And as I progress in this quilt, you'll see I do not quilt this far to the back of my machine because I am really quilting at arm's length right now. But when I'm closer to me at the front, I much prefer the higher height. Um, far less fatiguing for my neck and shoulders and it just helps my visibility, I think. You can see how my tape is not a hard and fast line. It's kind of buckling and what have you, but it's enough to just give me a guideline. That's all I need from it. And then with this particular design, I break thread at the end of the quilt and every row is done from left to right. And I realized while I'm here that I was busy talking and did not add my stretchers onto the left and right sides and I need to do that. So I'll just do that quickly while I'm here. This is just one more safeguard to keep the top of the quilt not tight like a drum, but snug so that I don't get wrinkles in the backing fabric underneath. So if I were to reach under my quilt top now, uh, we can see me at this end. Can you see my fingers here? No, you can't. Um, you can kind of see. If I just put, I'm just putting my fingers up from underneath the quilt, I should be able to, to grasp my fingertips right through the quilt. Like it is not so tight that it's like a drum. It's just snug. That's all I'm after. So both from front to back and from side to side. J just snug. So now while I'm at this end, I'll use my ruler. I'll measure three and a half inches down again with my tape. Once again, I'm gauging by the seam allowance that exists in the quilt. 
and I'll just run across the top of the quilt now with that tape at approximately that measure. I'll check it once at the other end. Yep, looks good. And then we just rinse and repeat. I think you can see by now how the fans are forming. And you can see as I'm quilting that the curved sides of them are toward me. And this is why I loaded the quilt upside down. So that when it's finished, the tops of the fans will, the top curved portion of the fans will be at the top of the quilt. And I just do that little ziggy zag of a few stitches at the end to lock the stitches in place. That all falls well within the seam allowance at the edge of the quilt. Once again, use my ruler to mark my three and a half inches, gauge where that is against some seam that's in the quilt and just follow it across. I think what I might do for a couple of rows, guys, is ask Dave to take to turn off the webcam that's on the needle because that's the one that tends to vibrate the most. And I'll do it at the speed I kind of would on a quilt. So you'll just see it on the overhead camera. Sure, let's do it for a couple of rows. Okay, Dave has an idea here. He's gonna hold the other camera and follow me so you'll get a better view. But I just thought it might be of interest to you to see what speed 
is more typical because I am slowing it down or I have been for the last couple rows to keep the camera from vibrating so terribly. Tell me when you're ready. We're just fiddling with cameras here a second. I'm grabbing another sip of coffee. I'll try not to slurp into the microphone. Still changing cameras. But hopefully this will be a good view for you that will help you, um, yeah, be able to see how these fans come together. Okay, we're ready to go. So at the beginning and the end of each row, I'm just kind of eyeballing what I think the fans would look like if they were cut off in mid-stride, so to speak. And that's how I lay down that first fan. Once you have gotten the hang of these fans, it's easier to make smooth curves at a higher speed. So that's why I prefer to do this a little bit faster. Also, it's a fairly time consuming design if you do one leisurely fan at a time. So this gets the quilt done too. Again, I'm just imagining what that fan would look like if it was chopped off in mid-stride. And I put the last little tips in there on the right. So there you go. That's more typical of the speed that I would quilt this design. And this is one of the few edge-to-edge -edge designs that I do not do with the stitch regulator off. Um, those of you who have been here for multiple episodes know I often talk about that, that I generally prefer my edge to edge quilting with the constant speed on. In other words, the needle's just going at a fixed rate and my movement around the quilt, the speed of my movement determines the length of stitches. It helps me, it forces me to quilt smoothly and evenly and I find it more enjoyable to not have that revving of the motor. But for this particular design, uh, it's hard to get it even with the stitch regulator off because you're doing these curves like curve stop, curve stop, curve stop. So does that all make sense? Uh, sure, let's do another quick one. And then we'll slow down again so you can have a better view of what's going on. Tell me when, Dave? Mr. Producer, sir?
Okay, we're ready to start again. Once again, Dave will shift the camera along so you can get a pretty good view of this. Something I do focus on as I'm doing this is keeping my tension in my hands low. So don't force this speed. If you're finding that you're, you've got a life and death grip on the handlebars, you know, then you're pushing too hard. You should be able to still relax enough that you can literally lift and wobble your fingers. Don't, don't be gripping. It's funny, when I'm quilting, my words don't always come out right, so forgive me. Maybe I'll just be quiet and quilt now. Maybe Dave can do a quick pan of that quilting. Can you see it at all close up? Not super well. It gives you an idea. And of course, you're looking from the back side of Lucy, so you're actually seeing the fans right side up. From where I'm standing, they're upside down. So I'm just quickly grabbing my ruler and my adjusting my trusty painter's tape. Checking it at both ends. Yep, very good. <laughs> Dave's apologizing for the trembling camera. <laughs> All right, let me know when you're ready to begin again. I think we'll go back to our sort of normal speed because then I can talk a little more. I feel like the machine is so loud when I'm quilting quickly. Anyway, hope that was helpful. I know people ask me from time to time, you know, what speed do you actually quilt? So that was an example of it. There are some questions, so let's take a break for a second. I'll have a coffee, and we'll talk about some questions. Okay, you've got me on the little close camera. Okay, big camera. Here we go. Heidi, sitting here watching you on my little peeps play outside. So, tiny story for all you people. Heidi and I go back to, like, toddlerhood together. We've been friends for a long time. <laughs> and who else? 
Linda, that went away quickly. I like your version of the fan design. I've tried this in the past, but lots of tracking back on the curve. So much quicker. Yes, mine just has that very tiny backtrack at the beginning. So pretty, pretty easy. Sienna, do you mark a little further down the quilt to prevent the shifting of the fans too much one way or another? I do not. Sienna, certainly you could. I just kind of pay attention as I'm quilting. If I find that they're getting squeezed in one area or too spread out in one area, I just adjust a little bit on the next row, stretch them or squeeze them as necessary. That's my way. But I've quilted this fan thousands of times, I'm sure. So, like not thousands of quilts, but thousands of fans. So mark if you need to, but I don't think it's that exacting. I really don't. Laurel Allwelling. Looks like a great design to learn the feel of my machine. It probably is. You've got to be pretty comfortable with curves, but I tell you what, if you do a whole quilt like this, you'll be more comfortable with curves at the end. Hi from Susan Tap. Susan Tap, hi from Grays Lake, Illinois. Very nice. Glad to see you here. Okay, one more sip for me. And we're back to the quilt. And as always, I will post some finished pictures of this quilt so that you can get a better look at it. I know it's hard because I'm always moving and it's always vibrating a little to really get a good sense of it as I'm doing it, but I will post finished pictures of the result when it's all done. I think it was Sienna that was asking about spacing. Kind of how I judge my spacing is where the valley of the previous two fans were. I just judge where my current fan should hit that. Um, and that will kind of be personal to you, depending on how many spikes you have in your fan, that sort of thing. But as you progress down the quilt, you'll get the feel for that. And you can make that adjustment if you need to. If you find you're always moving toward the right, then just make that adjustment of where you're spacing your fan relative to the previous row. I wish you all could see and feel these fabrics. They are so rich. Almost all of them have a texture. Some of them rather linen-like, some of them kind of a waffle weave. Just, they're really interesting, but very rich and beautiful. first pass is finished I'm 
I'm just going to take my magnetic bars off, undo all the trappings. Let's take some questions while I roll the quilt. So to make it easier on myself, I have not rolled the full depth of what I could do because I have a 26 inch machine that's really at arm's length for me. So I've only rolled about two thirds or three fourths of the way. It means a few more passes, but I find it much easier to control, not surprisingly, when the machine is a little closer into me. So I'm just working my way along the front. You've seen me do this before if you've been watching. I grasp actually the batting under there too and make sure that batting is snugged smooth and straight as well as the quilt top. And I kind of run my hands over, um, you know, experience has kind of shown me I'll recognize quickly if there's a fold starting in the batting or even just a thick spot because sometimes I actually lift up the front of this floating quilt and just give that batting. Sometimes it needs just a little tug to keep it smooth and flat. If you start seeing your batting where the end is hanging, curving in toward the middle, you know the center of that batting is pulling up and you want to correct that before you get to the bottom of the quilt or you're apt to have a funny wrinkle at the end. Okay. And I kind of eyeball with whatever seams are in my quilt that they are straight along this rail. And that's how I line the whole thing up. Okay, a couple questions. Susan, hi from New Hampshire. What do you do with your tails? Um, in terms of locking the threads, I just do four or five stitches at the beginning of the row and several at the end that lock stitch it in place. Um, You'll see whenever I run out of bobbin thread, I'll show you how I do my, my change over there because that will likely be in the middle of the quilt somewhere. And then all those tails in the end, I just trim off. Linda, would you class this as a custom or as an edge to edge? It is an edge to edge. Um, it is a little more dense than some that I do. And so sometimes for my clients, well, always, that will result in a smidge higher price than some of the looser ones. But I, I have my edge to edge designs kind of classed that way. The uber loose ones, you know, the tighter ones, that sort of thing. Lisa, I love the look of those fans. A different take on a Baptist fan. Yes, it is. And I have attempted to quilt the Baptist fan too. But as you can imagine, it's got a certain amount of backtracking and um, needs more exactness to look really good. So this I found to be a little more forgiving. Okay, perfect. On we go. Time to move the tape down and get the basting in place. So we'll just pull the tape in for a little bit and I'll baste at both ends. If I had been thinking and not talking, I could have actually just continued my thread at the other end and basted that end first. But I didn't. So much like I did at the top of the quilt, you might be able to see it at the other end, so I'll show you. As I'm stitching that basting line in, I'm always putting a wee bit of tension on the quilt where it has already been stitched. So let's see if you can see it better at this end. Sure, that will work, Dave, to get a different view. And I'll show you what I mean, because I know that a lot of quilters will recommend that you start basting from the bottom and baste toward and join up to your line of stitching. And the reasoning for that would be so that you don't push, you know, your fabric forward ahead of you and get excess fabric in there. But I have a different solution, which is I grasp behind the hopper foot that has already been stitched and I keep just a little tension on that. And if I actually have any excess fabric in the edge of my quilt, this one's really smooth. But if I actually had excess there, I would just pull a little harder and pull that excess under the needle. And if I have a lot of excess, then I pin it, distribute it, and pin it in advance. 
but this one's nice and smooth. So all it needs is that little, little bit of tension behind the hopper foot to keep it snug. So I'm just putting my fiddly little end stretchers on. These also, by the way, are by the Red Snapper Company. It's a new-ish design, a new model, if you will. And I certainly found them difficult to get used to, but they're getting a little looser and easier to use as time goes on, and perhaps I'm just getting better at it, too. All right. Let us measure our tape. And I predict, we'll see if I'm right, I predict I'm going to run out of bobbin thread in this row. We'll see if I'm right. Once again, gauging my tape pretty much by the seam line in the quilt. And the last thing is to put my magnets across the front to hold everything smooth and straight. There they are. So all of my starts and stops at this point are well within the quarter inch seam allowance at the edge of the quilt. So I don't worry about making that pretty necessarily. I will trim them all off at the end, but none of those little lumpies of thread are going to show. As soon as Aaron brought me this quilt, I thought of this fan design. It just somehow seems a little oriental to me to have a pretty, a pretty fan. And I do love adding quilting that is, doesn't strike you so much as a design as a texture. Once again, you know, it's the supporting role. Letting the piecing and also the fabrics in the case of this quilt be the stars. And I ran out of bobbin thread. You guys, look at that. Okay, so here's what I do. Many machines will have a um, gauge. Is gauge the right word? Sensor, I guess. So many revolutions of the bobbin, and it'll give you a warning when you're about to run out of thread. I personally choose to leave that off because I don't like wasting that last couple yards of bobbin thread because it's never exact. I just quilt until I run out. And then what I do is I undo a few stitches because those last few stitches don't have good tension. And then I usually go back to a corner. So somewhere where I have, you know, paused as I was at a sharp corner. Can you guys see that? I'm not sure what you're seeing. Where's my scissors? There it is. So this is, was my little backtrack. And so there will be a couple stitches right there where I had that brief pause. That's where I'm going to make my splice. And especially when I have a busy quilt, I just drop something right there where that splice is so I can find it easily when I come back. And then I pull Lucy off to the side and change out the bobbin. I load my own bobbins because I prefer to use the same thread top and bottom. And so I'm just going to set another bobbin loading. I'm off camera doing that and you'll be able to see how long it takes me. It's not very. So to me, it's not a bother at all to load my own bobbins. That's how long it takes to set a new bobbin going in my bobbin winder. And it'll be ready by the time this one runs out. Okay, back to our wee splice. Once again, I'm pulling up my bottom thread. So I just, I hung on to the top one, pulled, well, let's do it again. Let's just do it one more time for you. Okay, I'm hanging on to the top thread. I take one stitch. That enables me to pull up my bobbin thread. So now I've got both of them held in my hand. So they can't, um, it can't come unstitched. And I just put three or four very tiny stitches 
right there side by side. And then I go on stitching. And then I come back and snip those threads. And that is a fairly unobtrusive thread break. There are certainly fussier and more perfect ways to do thread slices. They take time. So each quilter gets to decide for themselves how much time they want to spend on that. And of course you're going to consider what the quilt's purpose is. If it's a high-end show quilt and you're hoping to win a $10,000 prize, well, it's well worth the time, isn't it? But with a little practice, you can make those um, corner splices be pretty unobtrusive. We've ended our thread. We're moving our painter's tape. Maybe I'll show you too one of my favorite tension checks. And I almost do this without thinking, so you probably didn't even see me do it. When I put a new bobbin in, I do not always run the TOA gauge, which is a little um, handheld tension measuring device. I tend to be more pragmatic about it. I've got the same thread top and bottom, so it's not likely to change much during the course of the quilt, but just in case. What I do is similar to measuring my tension under there. I just put my hand under the quilt and run your fingernail sharply, firmly along the bottom of the stitching. And if your bottom thread is at all tight, you will feel that. It'll sound like a little ladder with your fingernail going over it. So you'll know then that the bobbin thread's not too tight. And you can look from the top and see if the top thread is too tight. It will look hold a little straight and tight. So that's a good base gauge to see how your thread is. And I'm actually looking at mine now and I'm seeing at the corners just a little bit, my top thread is a hair too tight. So I'm just gonna loosen that up like an eighth of a turn of the dial, a little bit. We have a question on the basting, let's see it. Sienna, I struggle with basting the edge of the unquilted sides because they're wider than the quilted portion due to shrinkage. How do you deal with keeping the quilt sides even from top to bottom? It's kind of a cautionary measure, Sienna. Like obviously I'm basting the sides before I quilt in the middle. And then with every pass, I always am gauging the front of my quilt like that this is straight along the rail. These bars help hold it in place. And so I'm not letting that quilt pull up in the middle. 
if you're finding that it does, I feel like either you're not holding the center snugly enough or you're not pulling up the sides quite quickly enough and they're actually stretching as you're quilting the quilt. So try from both of those angles to see if you can get that more smooth. Another question? Linda, the fans look great on this quilt. It's nice to see a masterclass stitch in action. Thanks, Linda P. from Arizona. So Linda's referring to the fact that this particular design is in my freehand quilting masterclass. <laughs> the name didn't want to come there for a minute, of which Linda is a student. And so within that masterclass, not surprisingly, I go into it in much more depth, the formation and the measurements and so forth. But it is kind of fun for those students to see it in action. Okay. So while I'm quilting the next row, I did promise you guys to tell you about something new that's coming today. Um, and lots of you are on my newsletter mailing list, so you may even have gotten notification of it last night already. But here's what the new thing is. I've expanded my All Over Feather webinar. So it used to be an hour long webinar, mini class, and I've turned it into a mini series. So it is now going to be presented over four days and each day we'll have a small um, sort of segment of teaching about the feather and give you a chance to then practice that day, whether on paper or doodle board or on actual fabric, and then come back the next day and add to the skill and ask questions and all that sort of stuff. So that is, I believe Dave's got sign up information linked to this event so that you can find it easily. Um, also, if you're receiving my newsletter, you have certainly gotten notification of it. And that will roll out next Wednesday. So the 21st is the first day. And it runs Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. So each segment is live. So I'll be presenting part of the lesson as a video, but I'll be there live doing the talking and then interacting with you afterwards. Um, if you're not able to make it live, they're all at nine o'clock in the morning. You can certainly watch them later. It just obviously won't be as interactive for you. It'll be a replay. But you can come back and watch them all week. So that's the fun new thing. So a number of you that are watching, I know have been to my all over feather webinar. You are more than welcome to come again. I know for myself, I pick up a little something new, you know, even in repeat classes. And it is, of course, free. It's just a fun, a fun thing. I think every quilter ought to know how to be comfortable with an all-over feather. So. One of the many things that I love about freehand quilting is it gives me the freedom to adjust just a smidge as I go. I'll try and find a good example for you in the next row. As I'm quilting, whenever I see a thick seam allowance area, I purposely quilt right over it to hold it down nice and flat. If I quilt a quarter inch beside it, that is when you get kind of a funky looking little bulge. When I release it off the tension of the long arm, that seam would sort of pop up. Um, this quilt does not have heavy duty seam allowances, but there are some places at which a number of seams intersect. 
Uh, have we got the, could we put the little camera on, Dave? And I can show you one that I did right here. You can see that there's just a number of seam lines intersecting there. Here's another one. So this is thicker fabric than some. So although this is only an intersection of seams, it is somewhat bulky there. Well, I have purposely stitched right over that intersection, making it lay as flat as possible. It really makes a difference in the end result of the quilt as a whole, I feel like. So that's just another of the things that I love about doing designs like this freehand. If your computer was doing it, it could not make those adjustments on the fly. But you can. And I don't go vastly out of my way, but you know, I can often shift the arc of a fan a quarter inch to catch a seam allowance. I didn't count my rows of lanterns before we started. So I'm not really sure how far we are. We're not halfway yet. So if you need to freshen your cup of coffee, I give you full permission. Do it. I'm sure you can see how I'm treating the painter's tape just as a guideline. Sometimes I actually bump up against it. Sometimes I'm nearly a quarter inch away from it. Um, I don't think that's hypercritical. When it's all said and done, the fans will still appear to be in rows. It's just a guideline. There are some seams right there, which I purposely made the tip of my fan go right over them. And there again, I do it so automatically, I'm having a hard time um, calling your attention to them before I hit them. Here comes another one. Right there. And as I said, I'm not going way out of my way. I'm just, it's often just an eighth of an inch that I shift my quilting to cover it. And I'm partially able to do that because my eye is almost never actually on the needle where it's stitching. My eye is always jumping ahead to the next arc point. And so I do see a little ways ahead of myself what's coming. And I decide where that, where I'm aiming with my arc. Because it wouldn't do obviously to decide in the middle of the arc to change direction by an eighth of an inch. That won't be a very smooth arc, will it? So you do need to decide before you launch into it. And I don't want to overwhelm you with all that thinking ahead. I'm just literally letting you in on what's going on in my head as I'm stitching out these fans. I'm finding that I have shifted to the right by probably an inch. So in my next row, I'm going to pay a little attention to making them just a wee bit slimmer, especially as I come across the last six or eight bands to try and shift that back. 
a little bit, or at least to prevent it from keeping on happening. The truth of the matter is, it's not the end of the world, even if one fan gradually disappeared off the edge of the quilt. I don't find that that's, that has happened to me, and I don't find that that's an eyesore. Your rows are still intact, and that's what catches the eye. I believe we can do one more before we, oh yes, lots of room, before we advance. And I did check that, by the way. All I did was run Lucy right to the front rail and see how much leeway I have right here. So I was pausing there because I actually got an extra spoke in that fan and I was just double checking myself and counting. You notice I am not going back and undoing it. And I'll maybe ask Erin afterwards if she can find the miscreant fan. Um, it is basically the same size as the other fans around it. I just got one extra spoke in it. So I'm just going to let it be. And it can be a little rose among, a little thorn among roses. In my efforts to squeeze up my spacing a little bit, I kind of lost track of um, my overlap point for the previous row. But it is not the end of the world. A second, move my ruler out of the way. This time I'll remember and I'll leave my needle down right there while we do the advancing and then I can just continue basting down that right hand side. So I'm taking all my bars and side clamps off. Erin, it is an Amish quilt, a planned non-perfection. I will never notice it. The quilt is turning out beautifully. So this is Erin. If you're just chiming in recently, Erin is the owner of the quilt. And so... 
I sent her a link to today's project so she could watch the magic happen. Yes, they do say that the, I don't know if it's true or not. I should know because I kind of grew up in Amish country. But anyway, they say that when the Amish make quilts, they always deliberately create some imperfection in it because no one is perfect but God. So here I'm seeing that my batting on my left-hand side is curving in just a little at the bottom. That's a clue to me that I have not pulled the center quite snug enough. I'm not going to panic about it. There's no wrinkles in there, but I'm going to lift up my quilt and just apply a little tension on it toward the front and also shift it just a little. And I mean a little like a half an inch across the whole quilt. Just a little of adjustment on the left-hand side. You don't want to stretch it like crazy, though you could. Obviously, it has a lot of give. But, of course, it will, pull, it will want to pull back, you know, to its shape if you stretch it too much to its original shape. So you don't want to be manhandling it, but you can nudge it a little, I feel like. So once again, I've used my front rail. I'm gauging my seam allowances so that they run nice and straight along that rail. Also, now that I'm getting close... I can see the front edge of my quilt um, hanging. It's not anywhere near the floor anymore. I can gauge the straightness of that as well. So if I saw that hanging wonky in any way, I'd be making adjustments to each pass as I go. Kudos to Erin. This quilt is nice and smooth, so I can't really show you any of that because there's no remedial work to be done. But again, and was it Sienna that was asking that you often have excess on the sides? This is where you need to be sure that you're not pushing out in front with the quilting. You need to be pulling that fabric in under the needle. Boy, that quilting light is not flattering to the hands, is it? Ah, oh, well. I don't think I actually talked about what thread and type of batting I'm using. We talked about the color of it. So it is Hobbs 8020. That is available in black as well as natural and white. So that's what I'm using. And my thread is Isacord brand. It's 100% polyester. And the color is 0128 for anyone who cares. It is actually a really nice color. It blends well. It's khaki, but it has a bit of gray tones to it so it blends well with a number of things it is a favorite so you all are welcome to chime in if you'd like we've already been an hour and a half and I don't think I'll be done in 30 minutes so do we want to persevere all the way to the end and see the quilt get finished Obviously, you're welcome to take a break if you need to at any point. So I believe we're at the halfway point right now. But of course, the loading and everything was uh, part of that original half of quilting. So it will not take another hour and a half, but it could take an hour. We're very close to it. Dave's telling me there are a couple of questions. Let's take those before we start quilting. Sandy, is it a trilobal poly? And if so, do you have to use a thread net over or a bobbin genie? Yes. Um, Dave's going to point to my thread net. I'm going to come around so I can point it out to you. Okay, have I mentioned I'm the queen of frugal? Here's my thread net. Here's my thread net. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I do always use one. Here's what it is. It is a lonely sock from my laundry room with the toe and the heel cut off. So it's just the center sort of straight portion from the foot. And that's what sits over top of my thread spools. So that was my solution to a thread net. Lisa, what weight thread is the isocord you are using? It's 40, Lisa. Um, I feel like it's similar to 50 weight in other threads. It's fairly fine. I, I like it. It's a good all-purpose thread. That's it? Okay. On to quilting. 
And it, what you're seeing, I think I showed you this spool. That's a 5,000 yard spool. That's what I typically purchase it in. And that will do a number of quilts. I can't really say how many because it depends on how dense, but I would say anywhere from four to six or eight quilts could be done out of that one spool. Maybe even more, I suppose, if you had really loose quilting, but of the style I do, that seems about right. And there's a big seam allowance right there that I just went over on purpose. Stitch it into submission. And there again. It seems like a little thing, but it does make a good size difference, I think, overall, in how flat and smooth your finished quilt lies. So last Monday, during Live and Unscripted, we were talking about books, and I asked for some suggestions, and a few of you ladies tossed out a couple that I really wanted to explore. So I went back into the event afterwards, and do you think I could find those comments? No, I could not. So, if you're so inclined, would you make them again today, and maybe even just make them on my Facebook page, not necessarily in this event? Someone asked the question earlier um, if I still consider this an edge-to-edge -edge design or a custom. And I kind of branched off into how I price different edge-to-edge -edge designs. But the short answer to that question is this is definitely still an edge-to-edge -edge because it is quilted without any thread color changes and without any attention to um, where the seams or the piecing lie. It is the same quilting done across the entire quilt top. So while it may take a smidge more time than some other edge-to-edge -edge designs, it still is an edge-to-edge -edge and it's nothing like the time required for a custom. And I know I'm kind of weird, but this is the type of edge-to-edge -edge work I love. I quite enjoy doing this repetitive type of design and just kind of making it a challenge to myself to make it as good as consistent and uniform and beautiful as I can. That's just my personal love.
this yellow gingham fabric that's under me right now has this secondary design of almost a plaid in the weave of it. It is so fascinating to get a close look at these beautiful fabrics. Well, I've managed to halt my veering toward the right, but I'm still coming out at about the same place each time. So I'm just going to let it be. I've lost about a quarter of a fan in terms of spacing. But again, as I mentioned earlier, it's the rows that are eye-catching, not necessarily the number of fans. So, And the first few times I did this design, I hadn't quite figured out my spacing, and so they really did migrate off the edge. And frankly, that looked fine too. I kind of have, you know, they were, I was losing fans off the one side and having to build in a new fan on the other side, and it looked totally fine when the quilt was done. So don't sweat it. Sure, let's take a comment. I need a sip. Teresa, how do you determine how big to make the fans? Um, personal preference, Teresa, but some of the things I consider is, you know, what makes a good texture and spacing across my quilt. So the size I'm doing today has spaces of up to about an inch, maybe a smidge over. And secondly, how big can you quilt circles, you know, curves that are pretty smooth. So, but play with it by all means. Susan Tapp, I think that Amish that Amish saying is kind of funny because they really don't have to purposely put a mistake in since we're all human mistakes just happen naturally. Agreed. Have I ever made a quilt without an oops in it? Doubt it. <laughs> Doubt it. Sue Rickman, catching up. Yard work yelled at me to get to work, so I'm late. Well, you know, you're never late to a quilt party. That's it. That's it. Okay. Back to quilting. So to give you a bit of an idea where we're at, this is a lantern and there's two more rows of lanterns. So we're coming along quite nicely. So maybe while I'm quilting, Dave would like to put a poll out there. Thinking of the things I'll be doing live next. Um, next week, chiefly because of that all over feather boot camp that's coming later in the week. I am still going to do a live on Monday, but it's going to be a fairly small and concise project. But the week after that, so that would be in the mid 20s of April. Maybe like the 27th of April. Is that right? Anyway, two weeks hence from today, would you rather see a single edge-to-edge -edge project like I do most often, or would you like to see another custom quilt, which we've done a couple of times, so that would likely be a multi-day affair.
Sue mentioned she was outside doing yard work. I'm curious, are are you a seasonal quilter where you quilt more in the winter or in the yeah, basically in the long the shorter days, the longer winter months, or are you just a year round compulsive quilter like I am? I know my mother who was a crafter in general. She she quilted too, but she did lots of knitting, crocheting, kind of the old fashioned crafts. But she was very much a winter crafter. So in the summer she was out in the garden, um, raising chickens, those sorts of things, and then Long about October, out would come the crafts again. After, mind you, we had done the enormous fall house cleaning. There was always that first before you could relax and sit down with your knitting. Which reminds me, actually, um, we have another fun new event happening this week. If you're watching this live anyway, it's this week. Um, April 15th, my, the first episodes of my podcast are going to be ready to be listened to. So the name of, the, name of the podcast is called Measure Twice, Cut Once. And all of you who are on my newsletter will receive um, a handy little email with a direct link to it on the 15th, the day that they drop. But what reminded me of it is the first episode I interviewed my sister. Because we have lots of memories of, of quilting specifically with our mom, but just of crafts in general in our childhood. Which was a little bit unusual by some standards, so I invite you to listen to the podcast and get all the details. Once again, I'll pause with needle down and we shall advance. We have two more passes, I think we'll do it. Oh yes, easily. Okay, we have another couple of questions. As always, I have to take my glasses off to read the screen. Hey, 
Here they come. Susan Tapp. I have a question on your batting. Do you go to the other room and cut a piece the size you need and then load it, or do you have a roll under your machine? I do have them in a separate room. Um, right next to me, I'm in our basement family room, and right next to me is an unfinished room that had bare studs on the walls, and so my husband actually built me a rack so that I have several kinds of batting hanging on rolls, so I go into the next room and cut it. And side episode, and I think I wrote a blog post about this too with more details. I took painter's tape, one of my handy tools, and I ran a strip along the concrete floor with markings on it. So I can actually pull my batting out and I just keep the floor clean and I can pull my batting out to measure and cut it. Sue Rickman, heck no, I quilt all the time. Even practice motifs with my finger on the blankets at night. I love it. I love it. I love it. That's fantastic. Sandy, year round fanatic. Oh, good. I am in good company. Favorite platform for watching videos like this? Facebook, YouTube, no preference. Wow, a lot more of you Facebook than YouTube. Okay, what would you like to see for the next Live and Unscripted? Single day, 33%, single day, okay, what? Oh, okay. Our, I see what happened. It, it doubled up the answers. So if we add those percentages together, we're running about 50-50. Okay, you guys are not helping at all. <laughs> That's funny. It's exactly... Uh, yeah, let's let's get some more votes. Let's hear some more people. Put it in the... Put in the swing vote. Dave will open the poll up again, and you can jot in some more answers if you like. Otherwise, I'll just pick one. But you can be fairly sure that whichever one I pick, the other will eventually come your way. <laughs> Sue is suggesting instructor preference, sort of like chef's choice, that sort of thing. Well, and it may come down to that. Um, you know, if it's my own quilt, obviously, it's hanging here anyway, so it's easy to make the decision. But when I do client quilts, as these often are, then it kind of depends on what is currently in the lineup. Oh, I'm having a rough time with my quilt edge over on this end. It can be so stubborn sometimes to get these little seam allowances in my clamps. Oh my goodness sakes. Okay, I'm giving up. When all else fails, just put the two clamps on. Actually, before I put that clamp on, I like to baste before I clamp. So let's do that first. Because this is not instructional necessarily, you're seeing me take shortcuts. So if you're a new quilter, I pretty strongly recommend that you pin the quilt in place before you start basting like that um, until you really get the hang of how much give is in the fabric, how much it stretches, all that sort of stuff. Um, I've done quite a few hundred quilts. So, you know, it comes very easily to me now. So you are seeing me indeed cut corners. But don't, don't feel like you have to cut those sorts of corners and that you're not a good quilter until you do. If you, know, if you need to pin it or if the quilt calls for pinning because it's got unevenness or whatever, by all means, do it. You'll be happier with the result. Another question? Sue Brickman, is there a specific reason why you go back at the end of each row rather than just quilting back to the other side? With this pattern, absolutely. Each, each fan, and you'll see it in some of the pictures. I'll do a couple close-ups when I post them. Each fan is nested into the one that came before, and I would it would be like quilting backwards. Literally, it would be like writing with my left hand to do it the other way. It would be very difficult. 
So I do not do that with every design, but with this one I do. There are a couple of, I call them row-based designs that I do one row at a time from left to right. So I'm getting a fair bit of lint in my hopper foot. So I'm just going to take a tiny corner off my batting at the very end and move off of my quilting area. I do this fairly frequently when I'm quilting. And just clean out my hopper foot a little bit. Even using 100% poly thread, there just is some lint buildup that occurs. And sometimes that is greasy, so I don't like to take the risk of it dropping onto my quilt surface. I'm shortly going to run out of bobbin thread again. Will it be this row? I'm not sure. These are the games I play with myself, predicting when the bobbin will run out. Guess what? I called it. Now, where did I set my seam ripper, people? Oh, there it is. It is in my little cup of tools. So, once again, I am just backing up a few inches because there's no bobbin tension on that last couple inches. And then I'm continuing to back up to the last point because there will be some close stitches right there which make that point, you know, kind of reinforced. And I'll begin my new bobbin at the same, the same quarter inch area and it will be pretty well invisible. And I drop my seam ripper right there so that I know where to go when I come back. This time I did not start a new bobbin because I am confident that this bobbin will finish it. And I hope it won't make me a liar. How deep, like how tall are the fans, someone's asking? Three and a half inches, yes. Oh, I missed my one magnet. Let's put that on place. Sorry about that noise. That's probably an awful clang in the microphone. So again, I'm pulling up my bobbin thread, putting in four or five really closely spaced stitches, and then launching into my new stitching with my new bobbin. Pause for a second and cut those thread tails.
looks wider at the left end. It is a little bit. I'm going to adjust my tape just a hair. An eighth of an inch of difference I'll take. A quarter inch is a bit much for my exacting sole. All right. We're making headway. The end is in sight. Not quite here, but in sight. A swirl of coffee while I'm down here by the mug. All right.
just feel that my tape is a bit low. It's funny how after you've made, you know, a few hundred fans, you're like, you know, that one's a quarter inch too short. You may have noticed that some of my fan tips fall short of the line they're meeting by a stitch or half a stitch. That's kind of on purpose. And the faster I go, the more I tend to do that because if I try and hit it square on, I find that I overshoot a little bit. And I think that the overshooting catches the eye more than falling a tiny stitch short. Again, the things that I ponder when I'm doing monotonous quilting. But that's just my personal opinion. Short looks better than overshooting the mark. And it's hard to hit everyone right on, so I tend to go toward slightly shy. Okay, we have another question or two, a comment. Mm, I keep moving off. <laughs> Which camera are we aiming for, Dave? Aaron, I would like a custom project single day. See, I don't know that that would honestly happen, Aaron, because most custom projects take longer than a single day. Um, I mean, they might be an eight or 10 hour project, but that would like be without stopping or breaks. And I don't generally quilt that long, and you guys would get really tired of watching that long. So, yeah. Who is David S. Smith? It looks like a custom project has the votes, but Quilter's Choice carries a lot of weight in the Smith house. <laughs> well, as I said earlier, it does um, a great deal depend on what sort of quilts come in. You know, even what types of designs that I think would be interested interesting to you or lend themselves to this type of live streaming. I do know that I have two um, custom quilts of my own that are here in the lineup. And so that's, that's a real good chance that that's what you'll get.
don't know if you were able to see that little bump there, but I just bumped the um, side clamp. But as I was right in the seam allowance, it was not a big deal. I'm going to leave my needle down here. This is going to be our last advance. And this time, when I, well, maybe I'll tell that story when I get there. Let's advance first, one thing at a time. Take all the apparatus off. Is there a plural word for apparatus, or is that a apparati, Dave says? No, I don't think so. Uh, maybe apparatus refers to, or could refer to something that is plural. So there is the end of our little quilt. Once again, I have, I'm eyeballing that the front edge of this quilt is straight, but I can see that I need to coax it a little bit in a couple places, so I am going to take time to put in a few pins. I had said I was going to leave my needle down, but in fact, I'm going to bring my machine forward and put my channel lock on which locks Lucy into a position horizontally. And that way I can get a pretty good sense of getting this straight. So as I'm just sliding her across, I'm making sure that the hopper foot is right at the front edge of the fabric. I do not always do this, perhaps not even often. But this fabric is just is a little different than cotton. It's, it is certainly heavier. It's kind of halfway between a cotton and a canvas even for feel. And so not knowing exactly how that might behave as I'm trying to, you know, pull it a little bit to coax it into straightness, I just feel like it's worth my couple minutes to go ahead and put some pins in place. And then I'll know where I'm at. Just a little long at this side. Coax some of that up in there. Take up the slack when we start quilting fans. So now I can confidently say that my quilt is within an eighth of an inch of square, which I think most quilt makers would be satisfied with. Let's pick up all our... Sam says apparati is the plural for apparatus. Does somebody... Does somebody want to Google it? You did not know this was a vocabulary lesson too, did you? So this time I'm going to base down this right hand side and then just continue right around across the bottom and up the other side. And that will finish the basting. Apparatus says, yes. Apparatus says, Dave has Googled it for us since he is sitting right at the computer. Now we know, apparatuses. That sounds like a tongue twister to me. So once again, you probably can't see it on camera, but I'm putting a little tension on this side, the side that is already stitched. It just keeps the hopper foot from pushing up fabric in front of it. Also, I'm a very naughty girl and I stitch over my pins. I go slowly, knock, knock on wood. I have never yet broken a pin or a needle doing that. And there you can see. See how my fabric is pushing out? Where's my pointer here? Because my finger makes it turn so white. You can see how my fabric is pushing out in front. If I were to continue on, that would really want to push out of the straight line. So that's why I need to put this little tension on the area that's already stitched. Maybe even a little more tension. Get that excess in there. And the pin helps too because it must take up the excess by the time it gets to the pin. 
It doesn't let it keep building and building. All these little things, they seem tiny. But they really help in the long run to get a really good result. Apparently Sam is com commenting that apparatus is better. I agree. I mean, if we're going to have weird sounding words for plurals in English, you know, why stop now? I know as kids we used to call, we lived in northern Canada, right? So we saw a lot of moose and we called plural moosen. Who knows why? But it was kind of a family joke. Once again, I'm struggling with my little end clamps. There we go. Got it. For those of you who are regular watchers and know about the feline quilt police, he is laying smack underneath of the long arm. Just keeping an eye on things. And on the left-hand side, again, I'm struggling. There's such a narrow, narrow channel in that um, stretcher, and the fabric probably had a fold right there, so you know how that just curls the edge a little bit, like a little, little bit, two or three threads, and I can't get it to slide in that channel. Okay, what I was going to talk about earlier is I am now going to look at the amount of space that I have left to quilt, and I'm going to divide it evenly into fans. So I found a bit longer ruler to help me out. But I don't think that I can see very well with that. So never mind that. We'll go back to the first one. So that's 9 inches. I have 15 and a half inches. So they're all going to have to go a bit short to get five more rows in here. So I'm just going to, once again, on my batting, I'm just going to make some marks. And I'm going to do them about 3 and a quarter. still going to be a little long. Okay, going back and putting them at three. So these last couple rows of fans, obviously, will be a little bit shorter, but I think it's preferable to have several rows that are a bit shorter, right, than have one row that is completely squashed. And it would be difficult, and I don't think would look very pleasing to have half a row. That's my personal opinion. You're welcome to try half a row. Anyways, so I have opted to put five, I think there's five rows of three inch fans at the end. So let's get my seam allowance for my guideline. Okay, we have a comment. Dave's laughing, it must be funny. Louise, Canada. I can't quite read it, it's over the print. One moose and three mises. <laughs> exactly. I mean, you can have so much fun with that because you have mice, right? So we used to say is more than one house heist. You know, you can go anywhere with those. Yeah, a lot of fun. <laughs> okay, back to fans. And I do this with all my row base designs. I just decide whether it's one that I can easy, easily just make it look like it ran right off the edge of the quilt, in which case I don't have to bother about the spacing, or whether it's one like this where I want to know exactly where it's going to end up, and therefore I need to evenly space it. And if so, just take time as I did before you're quite at the end. And it will be completely unnoticeable at the end that the few rows are a bit shorter. It's exactly the same thing you do when you're putting 
repeating motifs in a border, for example. And you either squeeze or stretch them. And if you do it across a few of them, it's unnoticeable. And you notice, of course, that I did not put my magnets on for this row because the quilt top is all rolled onto the surface now and it's all basted in place so it's not going anywhere at this point. This green fabric is absolutely impossible to see my quilting on. I'm just forging ahead because it's such a small area. If it was a larger area, I would have to fiddle around with my lighting to say, cast a shadow from the side. one well actually I don't even need my ruler anymore I forgot I made my chalk markings that's all I need let's double check at the other end oh yeah we're good We have some comments and questions. We'll take them now. Sure. So the first one is quilting that you have yourself for Sunday and Eileen. Eileen, I'm currently quilting a custom quilt. Your dresses quilt gave me confidence to do it. Good. I was able to base to secure and I'm rolling it back and forth and everything is stabilized so I have no worries. I'm so glad that's working for you. Yeah, it's not too complex to do, but what a load it takes off your shoulders once that is all stabilized and in place. Good. I'm glad it's working. Susan Tapp, since you're in the basement on a cement floor, what do you have under your feet to keep yourself from getting fatigued? Well, I am in a family room which is carpeted, and I also have a long, thin fatigue mat that runs uh, back and forth where I, where I walk. Charmaine, looking forward to the feather classes. Thank you for all your helpful ideas as you do the live events. Great to get real-time demonstrations. Good. I'm so glad you're enjoying them. It's helpful for me to hear that. It's encouraging. Just a little side conversation with the producer going on there. Okay, I'm just going to adjust my... 
microphone. Glasses and ear clippies don't work well together. Okay, we have four more rows to do. We are coming down the home stretch. My clips are hanging low at this end, so I'm gonna do one of my fancy tricks, which you probably can't see now, but we'll show you when we come down to this end again, which is I'm putting a yardstick under my um, tension straps to just hold the clamps up a little way so that I'm not at risk of bumping into them. the longest 5 4 3 2 1 countdown you've ever heard isn't it we're at three now sue is asking what i will do in the border um there is a border on this quilt and it's all the way around and because this is an edge to edge design i'm just quilting the same thing right through it just as i'm doing on the sides I will do the same thing and just continue right off the bottom edge of the quilt, which by the way is going to be the top edge of the finished product. If you weren't here at the beginning, I mentioned that I was loading this quilt literally upside down with the bottom of the quilt at the top of my working area because I'm quilting these fans curved side down 
and I want the finished quilt to have curved side up. Two, just two left. Okay. All right. So here we are at the border for Sue who was asking and basically I'm just that's, to me, the definition of edge to edge is that you just quilt without regard to any seams. So I'm not doing any pausing or stopping at all. I'm just quilting exactly the same thing right on through the border.
one. That's the last we need of the tape, so we'll ball that up and get rid of it. Let's see if I can make a basket over that in the trash can. Mm, no. <laughs> Basketball's not my thing, clearly. So let me show you at this end. Oh, you can't really see here either. I'm just taking my yardstick and I'm putting it underneath my clamp and straps just to hold my stretcher up just a little. And that way my machine does not bump it when I come to that end. Okay, this is your last chance for questions or comments. Last row here. And while you think of those, I'll give you a couple reminders. Um, please take a moment, if you will, to like and follow on this page. I would appreciate that. And if you want to support our endeavor to get a little better um, recording equipment, buymeacoffee.com forward slash stitched by Susan is a great way to send just a little one-time contribution, and I sure appreciate them. I sure do. Quite a few of you have done that already, and it just means the world to me. So you can see now that my fans are filling up almost to the top of that basting line. And I'm falling a little short of it on purpose because my basting is well within a quarter inch seam allowance. And I feel like Erin will be putting her binding on at a quarter inch. So I don't want these fans to have their tops cut off. So I'm just letting it fall an eighth or a quarter of an inch inside that basting stitch so that the whole fan will be complete. And I just ran out of bobbin thread. You guys heard me say I hoped I wouldn't be sorry and I am sorry. So I'm just gonna run over to my winder and get another one started. Oh, you know what? You guys, I did have a spare one. Okay, we're golden. Back to my usual process, which is to undo a couple of inches of stitching. I'll move the camera so you can see it a bit. So once again, that bobbin thread, the last few inches does not have proper tension on it. So I don't wanna leave that stitching there. And then after that, I go back to the last corner. And I actually think I'm going to go back one more. That was my, my little backtrack echo there, and it didn't work real well. So I'm not going to... Um, I'm going to go back one more corner, basically, to make it as unobtrusive as possible. Right there. Clip all my little threads, put all my little tools away. Oh yeah, put the new bobbin in. That is always helpful. When I'm not on camera, I do usually clean out the lint in my bobbin area about every second bobbin. With this particular quilt, I'm doing three and a hair, so it's going to be fine. But as a general rule of thumb, I have a, a fluffy paintbrush and I just whisk all that lint out of there every couple of bobbins. For a second and clip the threads.
And that's the end. Awesome. I will start undoing things. And Dave can load up any further questions if we have them or comments. Either one. Apparently there aren't many questions. So, good. You've all been good students. I'm going to move. I'm not sure which end to put Lucy at. She's in the way, no matter how I look at it. Um, I don't even know that I'm going to unload because this is not going to show well on camera. I will post some pictures um, for sure on social media with some details of the quilting, both front and, and back side of the quilt, so that you get a good look at it and kind of the scale on the quilt top. So yeah, that is a simple row-based fan. Oh, here comes a comment. Glasses off. Sue, I have a really hard time ignoring seam lines, block shapes, etc. I have to get over feeling confined by them and just go for it. Well, if you watch me for any length of time, Sue, I think I'll help you get over that. I am such an ambassador for edge to edge texture. You can, like it helps the quilt maker in every way. It's economical for them and then they can just go make more quilts and I'll get them quilted and I think it's beautiful. It's my opinion, but that's what I think. Any other comments? Nope. That's it for today. Thank you all so much for joining me. Um, on the 15th, when the podcast drops, I will send out an email so you can all get a link to go and have a listen to that. Three episodes will be dropped on the first day, so you have a little bit of listening time in there. And other than that, I will be back next Monday with another Edge to Edge project, and we'll let you know what the Monday after that follows. So if you're interested in the All Over Feather um, boot camp, then I think Dave has put a link on there to sign up, but for sure watch your newsletters. It will be in all of those too, if you're interested in that little mini series, mini class. So thanks so much for joining me today and I will see you next Monday.